I'm Erica Zavaleta, and this is Ecosystems of California. Today, I'm standing on a piece of the California coast just south of the dunes at Franklin Point, and we're going to take a walk called the 11 Ecosystem Hike and just have a look at the biological diversity, specifically the ecosystem level biodiversity of the California coastline here. Now the term biodiversity is most often used to refer to species richness, just the number of species in a place, however large or small. And California certainly has that kind of diversity. It's got almost a third of all of the species found in the United States. It also includes about a third of the species considered at risk in the United States, including half of all of the threatened invertebrates in the United States. So it has this tremendous species level diversity. But biodiversity also refers to diversity at other scales. It refers to the diversity of genes or ecotypes within a population of one species. And at the other end of the spectrum, it refers to the diversity of biomes or ecosystem types. In California, more than anywhere else, because of its large gradients of climate, latitude, its diversity of soils, has this incredible diversity of ecosystem types. Overlaying on that soil, climate, and latitudinal diversity, we've got fire, flooding, and the actions of animals influencing the vegetation that all allow an incredibly big range of systems to exist in a relatively small space. This is a really good place to look at one aspect of the underlying environmental diversity that gives rise to the ecosystem diversity we see on the landscape. Geomorphology and geology, so the landforms and then the substrate types, are incredibly diverse here on the California coast. Part of that is geology. You've got the Pacific Plate sliding up against the North American Continental Plate. And over geological time, as it goes, it breaks off pieces in different places of the Continental Plate and drags them up and drops them off here in California. So the result is this jigsaw puzzle along the coast of everything from sandstones and mudstones to metamorphosed limestone, which is marble. Superimposed on that, we still have all of these geological faults, and along those faults, we have outcrops of other kinds of rock, like the serpentine rock that we see throughout the Bay Area in little islands. So that's the geology. And then we have all kinds of geomorphology, the shape of the landscape as it's altered after those substrates are laid down. You can see behind me that we've got the sandy beach and then a cliff. The main rock down here at the coast is Santa Cruz mudstone. It's pretty hard. And so as waves hit the coast and erode those cliffs, the cliffs form and stay pretty vertical and intact. So we have the present day beach and the present day cliffs. This flat area at the top of the present day cliffs is an ancient marine coastal terrace. So the flat area is an ancient marine seabed. This first one is about 100,000 years old and it was uplifted by larger tectonic forces and it's backed, if you go inland a little bit further, by another relatively vertical or steep section of land. Those were the cliffs when this 100,000 year old terrace was the ocean floor. And above those cliffs is the second marine terrace. And that also was an ancient sea floor. And it also is backed by another riser, the cliffs that formed when that section of sea floor was about 200,000 years old. The terraces get older as you go up. There are five on this part of the coast. And because they're different ages, even though they're all Santa Cruz mudstone, the soil on them is developed differently. So as soils get older, they have typically more nitrogen and organic matter, so they're more fertile in that way. And since these are relatively young, you kind of have a fertility gradient as you go up and away from the coast. So we're gonna start our 11 ecosystem hike. See if you can keep track of all the ecosystems that we go through as we go. So if you start out off the shore, we have California's offshore ecosystem. And we can't see a lot of what's going on out there, but that ecosystem includes all kinds of communities of fishes and benthic organisms, as well as seabirds and marine mammals that are moving between land and the open ocean. The offshore system subsidizes a lot of the coastal marine systems. So if you come further in, we can't see kelp forests. And then you can see the beginning of the rocky intertidal. So down there on the rocks are communities of mussels, barnacles, sea stars, and so on. And the adjacent beach ecosystem have these contrasting strategies for dealing with the coastal margin. 
a lot of attached sessile animals on the rocks, a lot of highly mobile animals living in the sand. So those are two different ecosystem types right at the margin that are both really heavily subsidized by the ocean. They're also subsidized by inputs from land. So you move a little bit further inland to where I'm standing into the bluffs behind the beach there, and there's a typical coastal scrub community. So there are yellow bush loop in there. You're only gonna find that right on the coastal margin. And then there are also some species here right behind me, like poison oak and coyote brush that you find here on the coast in coastal scrub, and then also see from time to time in different systems inland. So that's what we can see standing right here already. Offshore, intertidal, sandy beach, coastal scrub. And now let's start taking a walk up towards the mountains over there. We're gonna see how many other systems we hit between here and the top of that first range behind us. You can't see them very well, but there are extensive dune systems behind me at Año Nuevo Point. And those dune systems, like the intertidal and the sandy beach, are really, really dynamic. But in that case, it's not so much about wave action and tides as it is about wind and blowing moving sand, structuring an ecosystem dominated by species that can cope with a really, really dynamic and stressful environment. So now as we move away from the coastal strand a little bit further, we're coming into coastal prairie. This is just a different type of grassland system that has some unique animal and plant species because it's a little bit moister and cooler here at the coast. It also tends to have more native plant species in it. The coastal prairie is a little bit better developed soils, a little bit higher nutrients, and um, you know, a little bit more of the influence of fire and burrowing animals, things like gophers, a little bit less the influence of all of the disturbance at the coast, a little bit less salt spray and salt inputs into the soil here. And you can see that grazing animals also potentially in the past had an important role in maintaining the structure of the system by keeping some of the grasses and other plants down. So we've come up a ways from where we started down at the coast and you can see now that the coastal grassland is giving way to more shrubs. We've got a lot of coyote brush in here and then also to conifers now. There's, um, there are Douglas fir um, increasingly dense as we come up the hill. So a lot of what maintains these grasslands is open historically is disturbance fire, grazing animals, keeping the woody seedlings down. And nowadays we don't have very much of either one of those things. So to some extent, we're losing these coastal prairies to the shrubs and the trees that are coming in and taking over. So now we're moving through a little section of, of scrub or shrubland and it's a little bit different from what was down at the coast. This is more of a chaparral system. It's a really narrow band of it right here before we get up into mixed conifer woodland, but you can see that we're definitely out of the grassland now and we're definitely not quite in the forest yet. There's some sticky monkey flower. It's a little bit late in the day, but this is a plant you find in coastal sage scrub. The flowers have a pretty large ball of nectar at the base if a pollinator hasn't gotten to them yet. So you can try to get a taste pretty awesome, although there's also an insect in there. <laughs> you can see how far we are from the ocean now. We're not a whole lot further than we were in that grassland, but now we've kind of turned the corner and are climbing up the next steep riser to the next coastal terrace. So we get further away from the coast, we're hitting this narrow band of coast live oak woodland. There are lots of different kinds of oak woodlands in California, but here at the coast, this is the most common one we find. And you can see that these live oaks are reproducing. There's acorns out right now. So the oaks here in this little patch are kind of interspersed with shrub and grassland and more of a savanna kind of configuration. But at other places in California, oaks form these more dense woodlands that we'll visit later on in the course. Here's a little forest stream running through what so far has been more of a mixed conifer forest, Douglas fir and redwoods. And um, right here in the riparian zone, there's some other things growing 
some broadleaf deciduous trees rather than the conifers that are on the hill slopes further away. Some maples and some alders, which is a nitrogen fixing tree. They keep their feet in the water and take advantage of all of this great moisture. It's dark down here, so there aren't a lot of things growing in the understory. So you have things like these western sword ferns that can tolerate these low light conditions. And then the stream itself is this really strong integrator of all of the systems around it and above it. The trees are dropping leaves and litter into the stream, and that's undergirding a food web in the stream of all kinds of detrital feeders, um, algal grazers, and other invertebrates. You have algae growing in the stream from the nutrients that are flushing into the stream from the land around it. And then in smaller ways, in a small stream like this, you also have matter and energy being exported back out to the terrestrial environment around it. You've got insects hatching out and emerging, which will then go out into the forest and serve as food in part for terrestrial organisms. Now we're climbing steeply through a mixed conifer forest. We've got a lot of coast redwoods and we especially have a lot of them down in the ravines as we pass through those. But there are also some evergreen broadleaf trees like tan bark oaks, California bay laurel, and then other conifers like that one behind me, which is a Douglas fir. You can see that the bark texture and color are a little bit different, grayer and more furrowed than the redwoods. So now we're in a true forest and we're again in a really low light environment. So in the understory, there aren't that many things. This is Oxalis oregana a species that is really well adapted to these low light conditions. It's got really thin leaves oriented straight up at the sky, the opposite of the leaves down on the chaparral, which are evergreen and leathery to avoid moisture loss and oriented vertically to the sun to avoid overheating. These are actually heliotropic, so they will track the sun through the sky to some extent as it moves, keeping themselves oriented to it to take advantage of as much solar radiation as possible underneath this really dense canopy of trees. From up here, you can see where we've been so far and how far we've come up. There's Anya Nuevo Island and the point with the dunes on it. Over to the north is Pigeon Point Lighthouse. And then you can see from the beach in through the coastal sage and coastal prairie, grassland, the oak woodland, the chaparral below us, and all the way up onto here where the McConifer Forest is. So we're leaving the redwood forest, the mixed conifer forest, Here's some redwoods and a Douglas fir. And as we walk up onto the top of the ridge, not only are we hitting some different moisture and temperature, we're also hitting some new geology. You can see that pretty quickly. It's going from this dark understory to this new high light environment. And the soils have turned kind of chalk white all of a sudden. So this is that soil diversity piece. We just came on to something different and all of a sudden we have endemic Santa Cruz Mountain manzanitas. So we're in kind of a chaparral here. We have really scraggly looking Douglas fir all of a sudden. Instead of those really big towering trees, the Douglas fir are small. They're a little yellow in the needles. And we're picking up new conifers. Here's a pine cone. So we're getting pine species. You can see those right over here. And this is an open cone, but as we walk, if you look for closed cones on some of these pine trees, you'll see those too. And the closed cones are adaptations to fire. Here are some right here. There's a whole bunch of closed cones that will only open and release their seeds when a fire burns through here. So we've come into this much more dry adapted landscape, fire adapted landscape, nutrient poor soils. And as we come all the way up onto the ridge top, more pines and manzanitas. And then there's one more species that we'll pick up as we get up here that we haven't seen yet anywhere. There it is, Passus manzanita. Here's a species we haven't seen yet. 
This is golden chinkapin. Probably it's called that because the undersides of its leaves are this yellow, this beautiful yellow. So this is an evergreen broadleaf tree and this one's in flower. And um, so we've come into our 11th ecosystem, this arid adapted mixed woodland, maybe this golden chinkapin chaparral. And um, you can see that the chalky substrate behind me and on the trail, it continues all the way up on the other side of the valley. This is looking kind of north and inland. And then we can see back to the ocean over here on this side. So we're headed back down from the ridge top now, back through that same series of systems. And as you can see, this incredible environmental variation is underlying this ecosystem diversity. And that's a lot of how it is that California can support so many different species.